gospel of Luke. I hope what the choir sang is your statement of faith. I'm telling you, we are living in dark days, and uh, we see it every time we turn on TV. We see it every time we listen to talk radio. That uh, our world is increasingly, increasingly uh, getting darker, more evil and wicked. We ever needed to pray for our leadership in our country. It's today. We need to be praying. Luke chapter number 9, taking a break today. I thought I'd get back to uh, 1 Corinthians tonight. But we're not going to make it back tonight. This will be a two-part message. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 23. And I want to speak to you this morning. And I want everybody to listen. I want everybody to look this way. Everybody look at me. The title of the message today is this. Are you a convenient Christian or a committed disciple? Are you a convenient Christian or a committed disciple? I want to give you the money statement, our money statement that we normally do for the message. I want to go ahead and give it to you up front. It's a little long, so I may say it twice. I want you to write this down. Becoming a Christian is as simple as believing the gospel. Becoming a Christian is as simple as believing the gospel. But being a Christian is nothing short of a lifelong commitment to follow Jesus in a walk of selflessness, service, and sacrifice. Now I want to read that to you again. Becoming a Christian is as simple as believing the gospel. Being a Christian is nothing short of a lifelong commitment to follow Jesus in a walk of selflessness, service, and sacrifice. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, infallible word. Verse number 23, Jesus speaking. The Bible says, and Jesus said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now I'll say this in a moment, but this message... I don't mean to, but it may really offend some. some. It may, I hope it challenges some. I, I pray, my prayer is, and I prayed this last night, and I prayed it this week as I studied. My prayer is that this message today, we would be able to look back on. We'd be able to look back on and say, you know what? That was a turning point for Blue Ridge View Baptist Church. Look back on this message and say, that was a turning point in my life. And it's not going to be a turning point in this church until it's a turning point in your life as a believer. A high water. Father, we love you. Lord, uh, thank you for this great singing today. I'm glad one day we get to heaven. Lord Jesus, there'll be peace. Lord, no more sorrow, no more trouble. And Lord, I'm glad as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, there's peace. Lord Jesus, I pray today now as we look into your word, I pray, Father, that we would go out of here today refusing to be just a convenient Christian. Lord, I pray that we would walk out of here today a committed follower, committed disciple of yours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The context of our passage this morning gives us the heart of the true gospel. It sets forth the, the major principle of true discipleship. And the, the major principle of true discipleship, I'm telling you this morning, it is in direct, it is diametrically opposed to self-centeredness. Being a true disciple of Jesus Christ is absolutely opposed to self-centeredness. You know, today we hear much about what one gets who who lives by the principles of God's Word. But you know, Christ taught, or Christ said, uh, had so much to say about what one gives to be a true disciple of Christ. I, I think we like to hear more about what, about what we get when we live by the principles of the Word of God. But you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ He taught so much about what one gives when they are a committed disciple of Him. The New Testament teaches that in order to be a, a committed disciple of Christ as opposed to a convenient Christian, there must be several things. First of all, that there's going to be the cross before the crown. 
If you're going to be a committed disciple of Christ, there very well may be suffering before glory, sacrifice before reward. The heart of Christian discipleship is giving before gaining, losing before winning, and, and so on and so forth. In our text, Jesus speaks of the high cost of discipleship, but not just, not just here in Luke. In every gospel account, in some way, Christ talks about being, or Christ talks about the high cost of discipleship. I thought about that this week as I studied, and I said, you know what? This is something that Jesus really wants us to get. I mean, this is something that Jesus really wants, wants us to take home with. This is the, this is the takeaway right here. I mean, He wants us to implement this into our lives. He wants us to care. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, Jesus says, He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. I tell, I, I'm telling you this morning, please, please hear my heart today. Please, please listen to me. This could radically change some of your lives. Listen, Luke 14, verse 25. Uh, the Bible says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, his own life also, he can't be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he can't be my disciple. John MacArthur, I love to read behind John MacArthur. He made this statement and I quote, he said, Christ's aim, listen to this, Christ's aim was not to gather appreciative crowds but to make true disciples. He never adapted his message to majority preferences, but always plainly declared the high cost of discipleship. Luke 16, 13, Jesus said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And I, I want you to hear what I'm about to say in the next three, three or four minutes. And I want you to take it the wrong way. I want you to hear my heart today, but uh, I, I've been pastor here at Blue Ridge View for 20 years. This is my 20th year as a pastor. I've never pastored another church. 20 years. I've been in full-time ministry close to, close to 25 years. Brother Paul's here. We used to take our youth. And Paul was our, our camp pastor when I was a student minister over at Rock Springs. Been in full-time ministry almost 25 years. Been preaching the gospel, Stacy. The 26th of this month, the night I asked you to marry me, right before I asked her to marry me, I preached my very first sermon. And dear Lord, I hope that, ser or that uh, proposal was better than that sermon. Amen? 27 years I've been preaching the gospel. As a rule, as a rule, my full-time ministry is, is probably half over. Half over. I thought about that yesterday and I, and I began to think, well, what has been accomplished? I mean, just what has, has been accomplished so far? When I came to Blue Ridge View in 1999, there were 504 members. 504 members. We are just shy of 1,000 right now, almost double. There were 188 in attendance the Sunday I preached my trial sermon. How do you know, preachers, you count them all? No, the vote, Brother Sammy, was 187 to 1. 187 to 1. 188 in worship on that first Sunday morning. And so I'm guessing the average, the average attendance, excluding that day, because, you know, everybody comes out to vote, whether they've been there all year or not. They're coming out to vote, amen? So I'm guessing the average attendance was somewhere between 150 to maybe at most 170. This morning, uh, with a full second service and a great number in the early service, there'll probably be between 350 to 375, 385 here on the campus today. In, in the last few years, a couple of those years, we averaged over 400 in worship. And so God's done, certainly God's done some some tremendous things. We've averaged as high as 280 in Sunday school. But you know what? We hadn't been able to go any higher because we don't have any more room. It's either build more or have more room or add another Sunday school. And that's a whole other message. Why am I telling you this? I'll tell you why. It's because I'm almost embarrassed 
at those numbers. I've missed the mark somewhere. Blue Ridge View has missed the mark somewhere. And if Blue Ridge View ha has missed the mark, then that's, that's a reflection of leadership. Why do I say that? I say it because salvation in Christianity is so much more than saying a prayer, being baptized, and added to the church role. It is, it is so much more in that it, than that. It's about commitment and being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I am ashamed to say that we have almost doubled in membership, but we still don't see 500 people every Sunday. Still don't see them. Now why is that? I'll give you a couple of reasons. Number one, because some are false converts. There's some on our church roll that have, have never been saved. They're lost. They will die and go to hell if they truly don't repent of their sin and come to faith in Jesus Christ. There may be some of you here today who are false converts. You, you have never been truly saved. How do I know that? It, listen, it's because your life shows no evidence of committed Christianity other than you come to church on Sunday because that's what a good Baptist does. So I, I believe one of the reasons we don't ever see them is because of false converts. But, but second of all, it's because some may have genuinely been saved, but I haven't discipled like I should have. To teach what the real Christ life looks, looks like. And so I made a determination. And it's already burning in my heart. But my passion and my desire for the next 20 years of my ministry. Wherever it may be. Is to teach converts how to be engaged in the Christ life. Through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, as one preacher said. I want to make disciples. I want to make disciples. A, a disciple is just a pupil or an apprentice, a learner or a student. But did you know that a disciple or a student can be taught without being transformed? Did you know that? We can have head knowledge and not heart knowledge. If you don't believe that, see Judas. He's exhibit A. He was a disciple. He, he was a pupil. He was an apprentice. But he didn't get it. The Great Commission, Jesus said in Matthew 28 and verse 20, not only are we to go out and win people, not only are we to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, but do you get the third part? Uh, the third part of the Great Commission is that we're to teach people to observe all things. You say, preacher, what do you mean all things? All things concerning the Christ life. The Christian life. I believe one of our failures as the church is that we have taught people information about initial salvation how to come to faith in Christ but we've been light on producing transformation I'll give you a quote the end result of discipleship is not merely the knowledge of all Jesus commanded but it's the obedience to all Jesus commanded us to do A.W. Tozier you know, I read after him. Y'all know I love him. He wrote a book one time, or an essay one time, called, I Call It Heresy. And here was, his, here was one of his quotes. Listen very carefully now. Some of you are going to get this. Some of you aren't because you're not interested. But I want you to hear my heart this morning now. A.W. Tozier said, I warn you, the Lord will not save those whom He cannot command. He will not divide His offices. You cannot believe on a half price. We take Him for what He is. The anointed Savior and Lord who is King of kings and Lord of lords. He would not be who He is if He saved us and called us and chose us without the understanding that He can also guide and control our lives. End of quote. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. You see, I am greatly concerned this morning. I'm greatly burdened with 21st century Christianity. You see, most Christians and most church members live and believe a no-cost kind of Christianity. No cost. No, no cross. No sacrifice. And so my desire this year and the years to come is to disciple believers in what it really means to be a, a true disciple of Jesus. A committed 
follower of Jesus Christ. I want to disciple my wife. I want to disciple my kids probably better than I have. I want to disciple my nephew out there and, and my other nieces and nephews. I, I, want to, I want to help lead them in the, the ways of the things of God, of all the things. we. And parents, I want you to listen with those children. The number one priest in your home is you, Daddy. Number one priest in their life is Daddy. A true disciple, here's the statement, a true disciple is one that has heard the gospel, that's knowledge, they've heard the gospel and is convicted of their sin. And as a result, they repent of their sin and surrender to Christ's lordship. And so the character, listen, the character of a true disciple, not, a, not just a convenient Christian, being, being a child of God when it's convenient, but the character of a true disciple is manifest in obedience. It shows in obedience. As a pastor and as a church, we can't approach discipleship as merely information and not repentance. That devalues discipleship and it denies the power of the gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. A disciple is more than a student who learns lessons by means of lectures and books. He's one who learns by living, obeying, and working with his teacher on a daily basis. Hands-on experience. One preacher said this, he said, too many disciples are content to be listeners who gain a lot of knowledge. We've already done that today. We've, we've gained some knowledge today since we've been here in the house of God. Too many disciples are content to be listeners who gain a lot of knowledge, but who have never put that knowledge into practice. My favorite preacher, Johnny Hunt, he made this statement. He said, it's not the truth we know that transforms us. It's the truth that we obey. Now that's a mouthful right there, amen? It's not the truth we know that changes us. It's the truth that we obey. So discipleship is a daily discipline. We follow Jesus one step at a time, one day at a time. Jonathan Edwards, some believe he's the greatest preacher, theologian America has ever produced. Jonathan Edwards, during the first Great Awakening, he was a mighty preacher during that time. And, and during the Great Awakening, the, a lot of people came to faith in Christ, but several years later, many believed that some, listen to this, some who claimed to become Christians during the Great Awakening were not true disciples, they believed. There was no change. There was no transformation. And so the lives of many of those supposedly converted appeared to be the same as before the Great Awakening. Before they said they got saved. And in response, Edwards wrote a sermon. And the title of that sermon was Treatise on Religious Affections. He addressed the issue of deficient discipleship of authentic faith. And, and in his writing, he coined the phrase, listen to this, he coined, some of you college students are going to have to read this if you go to a Christian college. He coined the phrase, holy affections. We, you may see the title, religious affections. But he coined the phrase, holy affections, as the distinguishing mark of true discipleship. Here's what he said, listen to this. He said, the supreme proof of true conversion is holy affections. Zeal for holy things. Longing after God. Longing after holiness. A desire for purity. And so the distinguishing mark, I believe, a, of a Christian disciple is a transformed heart and transformed affections. I don't love what I used to love since I became a Christian. Thank God I don't. But I love, some th I, I love more things than I never loved transformed heart and transformed effect. You see, when somebody becomes a true disciple, I'm telling you, Christ absolutely changes their life. Change, a lot of people want a no-cost discipleship, but Christ does not offer that option. The kind of Christianity that's prevalent today is foreign from the kind of committed life Jesus prescribed for his followers. You, he, here's what I'm afraid of. I, I'm afraid of because I see this in not just this church, in other churches. I'll be preaching in several churches this spring. But here's what I found. It, it won't be any different in a lot of those churches. We have made up our own definition concerning what Christianity looks like. 
We just made up our own definition. Some of you, I, I know you, you, don't, you already don't like this message. You say, I didn't sign up for this today. That, that's good though. That's the idea. Did you know, church, we are too comfortable? Christians, we're too satisfied. I mean, we're okay. A lot of us today, we're okay with the status quo. As long as people are coming like this and the building looks full, as long as the offering is good, I mean, we're okay with that. We're okay with the mundane. Let me tell you something. I just don't believe that God called me here and placed me here just to sit up here on this hill and maintain the status quo. And I don't believe God called you to be a member of this church just to do things as normal and just to be satisfied where we are. So I, I want us to consider carefully the words of Christ a, as we examine what it means biblically to surrender our lives to Jesus. What, what does Scripture say? I'll give you a statement. It's really a question. But it, ever since I heard it, it has absolutely my Sunday school class last week, our Sunday school teacher asked us this. Is Christ a full-time resident in your life or just a weekend guest? Would you ponder on that question for me? Is Jesus a full-time resident in your life or is He just a weekend guest? And that'll answer the question, am I just a convenient Christian or am I co a committed disciple? And so here, let, let's answer that today and, and tonight. First thing, that, first thing that I want you to uh, see is this. Uh, ask yourself this question. Since I accepted Christ, since I accepted Christ, number one, has the direction of my life been altered in any way? Has the path of my life, the trajectory of my life, since I became a Christian, has it been changed in any way? Has it been altered in any way? In verse number 23, Jesus Christ says, If any man, that is a straightforward invitation. Literally anyone, if anyone. You know what the good news is this morning, and I believe this, I believe this with all of my heart. I will not change on this. I will not back down on this. Listen to me. The good news is that Jesus is willing to receive anyone who comes to Him in faith. He'll receive anybody who wants to be saved if they're willing to repent of their sin. However, His call is not just to come to Him, but to come with Him. He says, don't miss this, He says, if any man will come after me, and that phrase, come after me, it points us to the fact that Jesus calls us to change directions in our lives when we come to Him as Savior and Lord. So, Jesus fully expected there to be a change of life when we became a Christian and we began walking with Him. Now, consider carefully the implication for us as Christians to come after Jesus with our lives. First of all, here's what, here's what that means. It means this. There's new leadership in my life. When I become a child of God, there's new leadership in my life. I follow a new leader. It is a matter of leadership. That phrase, come after, it is translated perfectly. It comes from a pair of words that literally mean, listen to this, get behind. Get behind. Jesus is to be our leader. He's the one who is in front of us. And the one whose steps we're taking right after he takes them. And so the Christian life is not one in which Jesus rides shotgun with us. And we go down the road and Jesus says, turn here, turn there. Oh no, listen my friend. The Christian life is one in which Jesus is driving, Jesus is leading, and I just follow him wherever he goes. He does not ask me to let him go with me. He calls me to go with him. So to be a follower of Jesus is to let Him lead. Let Him lead me wherever He sees fit to go. He's out there in front. I fall in behind Him. I trace His steps. Now, what is the application of this? What is the implication of this? It's going to get real, real quiet now. But what that means is, 
when He forgives me, I forgive others. It means when He blesses those that have cursed Him and, and He prays for those who have despitefully used Him, it means I do the same thing. It, it means I pray for those who have cursed me. It means that I forgive those who have despitefully used me. There's some of you sitting in here today and for every step forward, you take two steps back in your Christian walk because you're holding a grudge. You won't forgive somebody and God can't move in your life. And listen to me, God can't move in this church because there's so much unforgiveness. That means when Jesus does the right thing, I do the right thing. In all areas of my life, a committed disciple follows His Word. I don't choose anything, I don't choose anyone above the truth of God and above the God of the truth. I don't choose anything or anyone above Christ. You see, Christ takes seriously the commitments of His children. Say amen right there. Faith is not a flippant force that fluctuates based on feelings. Think about that statement. It's not original with me. Faith is not a flippant force that fluctuates based on feelings. How many times ha has our feelings dictated our faith? I'm going to tell you what, this old boy right here, many times my feelings have dictated my faith. I'm ashamed to say that, but it's true. Don't look so pious. Yours have too. Your feelings have dictated your faith before. Faith is the righteous resolve that is the result of a devoted disciple of Christ. You see, a promise made to God is an exclamation point of a sold-out life. It's at the crossroad of commitment that disciples are exposed as authentic or imposters. The crossroad of commitment. So here it is. Jesus says, if any man will follow me, let him, let him take up his cross. I want to ask you, you say, preacher, I... I, I do believe. I believe I'm a committed disciple. I don't believe I'm just a convenient Christian. I try every single day. I try to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I try to walk in submission to Him. I try to walk in the Spirit as opposed to the flesh. And so, preacher, I believe I can go out of here today. And I believe I can say I'm a committed disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, let me, let me ask you something this morning. Will we really follow Jesus wherever He goes? What if He asks you, young man, what if he asked you like he did me on November 5th, 1991, sitting in the, uh, the chair in my mom and dad's living room, doing my personal study of the Word of God? What if he calls you to preach? Sir, what if he calls you to go into full-time Christian service? Young lady, what if he calls you to go into full-time Christian service? Young people, what if he calls you to be a missionary on the foreign field? Are you willing to go there? What if he asks you to go with him and forfeit your dreams and your life goals and what you wanted to do with your life? What if he asks you to leave that behind and follow him where he wants you to go? You willing to do that? What if he asks, young people, what if he asks you to, to go with him as opposed to the dating relationship you're in right now. He says, no, I want you to leave that behind. Right now, I want you for myself. I've got a greater purpose and a greater plan for you than that dating relationship right now in your life. What if, he, what if he asked you this morning, what if he asked you to use your finances and resources in a greater way than you ever have this year for kingdom purposes? Are you going to follow him there? Our yes to our new life in Him means no to our own desires. Do you get that? Do you get that? I'm close. Look at me. Everybody look. As a committed disciple, and this is where some of us leave. This is, this is where some of us draw the line. Preacher, I hadn't signed up for this. I don't, I've never heard anything like this about Christianity. But listen. Jesus Christ will ask you to go places with Him that are not easy and are not fun. He'll ask you to go those places. Church, Blue Ridge View, He'll ask us as a church to go places and to do things that we don't think are very much fun and it most definitely is out of our comfort zone. 
He'll ask us, he may have already asked us at some point, we missed the boat. However, the beauty of fulfilling your promise to Jesus is that he's always with you. Amen? Regardless of your circumstance or regardless of where he asks you to go. So, I, I, when I come to Christ, I've got new leadership, but I also have a new love. Uh, Jesus said, if any man will come after me. Come after is the key phrase there. It was used often, listen to this, come after, it was used often in the context of a romantic relationship. So Christ is referring to following Him as a matter of love. He's, he's challenging those who would come after Him because they love Him and genuinely want to be with Him. You, you see, when you are a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, your love is seen, is put on display by the act of following Him. When I walk out into this world today, when I go to that restaurant or, or whatever I may do today, when I go to Walmart, pick up some things that I need, I am flaunting my love for Jesus Christ when I'm following Him and walking with Him and acting like Him down there at the restaurant. Or the store. When you're a follower of Christ, you come after Him. Not only because you're under new leadership, but simply because you love Him. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul said. 2 Corinthians 5, 4, Paul said, you know what, but it's just the love of Christ that constrains me. The love of Christ constrains us. You know why Paul served and followed Jesus? It wasn't first of all because he loved lost people. It wasn't first of all because he loved the church. No. Paul was constrained to follow and serve Jesus because he loved Him. The Christian life cannot be lived going in the same direction as, you, as you've always been going. There's a definite change in direction. There's a conscious coming after Jesus. It is a call. It is a call to loyal obedience. True discipleship is submission to the Lordship of Christ and that becomes a pattern of life. I was reading just yesterday a survey was conducted. It was, it was to learn more about people's spiritual lives. Brother Darren, their level of maturity in the Christian life. And here's what that survey found. Eight biblical factors consistently showed up in the life of a maturing believer. A believer that's growing. A believer that is more than just a casual, convenient Christian. Doesn't just, Christianity doesn't just show up on Sunday. I mean, it, it's a way of life. Here's the eight biblical factors that showed up in the life of a maturing believer. Number one, Bible engagement. They love their Bible. They love to study it by themselves. They love to hear it in church. Bible engagement. Number two, obeying God and denying self. How hard is that? That's a tough one. Obeying God and denying self. Number three, serving God and others. Number four, personally sharing the gospel. It's a sign of a growing believer. Sharing Christ. Number five, exercising faith. Number six, seeking God. Just seeking God. Number seven, building relationships. That's so important. And number eight, unashamed transparency. Unashamed transparency. probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. Probably shouldn't say it, but I'm going to say it. We're, we're having, talking about building relationships, having a little problem with some of our children integrating into, from middle school or from elementary school to middle school. Young people, are you listening to me say amen? amen. Sunday school teachers say amen. amen. They're, they're having a little difficulty integrating. You know why? One of the reasons why is because they don't feel welcome. Sunday school teachers, you're going to get mad at me in the youth department, but you know one of the reasons they don't feel welcome is because you stay in the kitchen all the time and talk among yourselves and you don't get out there and mingle with the kids. Now that was free this morning, okay? Say amen. Building relationships. Let me tell you something, my friend. 
that kid in that Sunday school, I, I can remember being in Sunday school even though I was a, a far from God. I can remember being in Sunday school. And my Sunday school teacher, Bob Leatherwood, bringing object lessons to class, taking us on hikes, camping out with us. And you know what? I may not remember a single, single, single lesson he taught. But I'll tell you this, my friend. I remember that he sat down and took time and invested in my life. So what's the lesson there? Get out of the kitchen. Make some friends. Build some relationships with these kids. No ugly emails. Alright, based on what we've heard this morning. Based on what we've heard. We'll, we'll finish tonight. Based on what we've heard this morning. Are you a convenient Christian? Christian when it's convenient. Casual Christian. Or would you say, you know what? There's a desire in my heart to be a committed disciple. Power of the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to do that, but I know I need to show up. Number two, is Jesus a resident in your life? Or is he just a weekend guest? Some guest. Heads are bowed out.